when you step foot in the woods. You're giving nature back the reins to your fate. You take your place back in the food chain. Just because you're fitted with your trusty lucky hiking bag, a full charge on your cell phone, and brand new hiking boots, that does not mean you get to leave the woods without at least a few bite marks from the things that are hungry, the things that are waiting for unsuspecting prey. What you're about to hear are allegedly true stories featuring people who ventured out into the woods and ended up becoming hunted themselves. They're lucky to be alive. If you have a scary story, share it with us at darkstories.org. I'm still looking for lost in the woods experiences and sleepover stories. Before we begin, I'd like to ask a favor. Using the links in the comments or the description below, could you leave me an honest review of my show on iTunes to help me get to 2.5 thousand reviews? There is also a link to my Spotify where you can follow me to catch all my new podcasts and help me get to 50k followers. I'm at 27k at the moment. I'll be requesting this favor as much as I can to get closer to these goals. The less reliant I have to be on YouTube, the better. Which means you'd be helping Darkness Prevails survive. Thank you for your support. Sorry for the wait. Now, let's begin. I tried to bait it. From Tully Road. I've been tempted to share this story for a while now. The following occurred on an island off of Washington State about seven years ago. My sister and her family moved from Oregon to Washington. I tagged along to check it out. It was different there. The woods in Oregon had a welcoming fantasy forest feeling, whereas the woods of Washington felt ominous, forbidding, especially at night. You could really feel the woods out there, if that makes sense. It was late afternoon. I was just chilling on the sofa at my sister's new place when she says she found out about a trail on this island. It was already late afternoon, but we said, what the heck, let's go check it out. Her husband wasn't up for it, but he agreed to drop us off and pick us up after. My oldest niece also decided to go with us. The place was about 15 minutes away, so we grabbed a handful of things and off we went. We were walking and talking, enjoying the quiet, it was a simple trail, nothing special so far. We get to this enormous tree that must have been six feet around. It's in the middle of where the trail splits off in two directions. One that leads towards the seashore, and one that leads further into the woods. So we head towards the sea. We hang there for a bit, taking in the view and shooting the breeze, before we begin to head back. We get to the big tree and decide to check out the other trail leading off into the woods. I don't remember who brought it up, but somehow the topic of Bigfoot comes up. Jokingly, I pick up a big stick and I start whacking it against a random tree on the side of the trail. Instantly, about 20 yards off the trail, before I'm even done with my second tap, a very loud wood rapping sound begins hammering a tree fast. When I say fast, I mean death metal blast beat fast and incredibly loud. We can't see anything from there and suddenly it stops. We stand there, startled. I think my niece said something about a woodpecker. We all agreed and moved on. From here on, you might say I'm making too much out of nothing, or that we're idiots. But you had to be there. You know the whole, the woods went silent thing. Well, they were already quiet, but something had shifted. The atmosphere had changed, and we weren't laughing now. Uneasy, we kept going and slowly started to relax and chat. Then from somewhere up above us, between the treetops and the sky, what sounded like a monkey began to scream. We froze. Everyone knows the sound. 
that unmistakable rising higher and higher call that monkeys do. Like laughter, moving closer and closer as it passes above us, it seamlessly morphed into a crow cawing. But though we followed the sound as it passed overhead, we didn't see anything. We kept moving. No one said anything, but we silently agreed to move back towards the exit. We finished the loop we're on and head back in the direction of the big tree. But we ended up on a part we didn't recognize. You know where this is going. We spent the next hour or so backtracking and pretending there wasn't a seed of panic in our guts. It was getting darker and the temperature was dropping. We focused on the situation and kept our cool. Finally, up ahead, I saw the big tree and we were all relieved. As we headed towards it, we hear the children. You know the sound of a big group of kids bursting out the school doors and laughing. It was like that, headed towards the seashore. I was relieved to hear people. We rounded the big tree and began heading up to the main trail toward the exit. My sister called her husband and told him to go ahead and come get us. Up ahead of us is a bend, and from around that bend comes two dogs. One big guy and one little guy. They're dragging their leashes. They stand there just looking at us, and as we approach the bend, they both turn around and go back. About twenty seconds later, we round that bend, expecting to greet the owners of the dogs. But there's no one there. No dogs, no people. It's a straight shot up to the exit from there. The sides of the trail are about eight feet high and steep. There's nowhere anyone could have gone. And that's when I remember the kids. It would be getting dark soon. So where are the children that I heard? Why would a crowd of kids be going to a random isolated seashore at this time of day? Then it occurs to me that we didn't hear any footsteps. A crowd of kids would have made much more noise, especially moving at that speed. Also, there were no footprints of anyone but us. Her husband has by then shown up and is waiting with the engine running. Almost there. Right before we exit the gate, a powerful stench of something dead and rotting hits me. I glance up to my left in the direction it's coming from and I feel a force of pure malevolence shoot right at me, like nothing I'd ever felt before in my life. Absolute and passionate hatred, indignation, aimed directly at me. My nose and eyes were glued to the spot, but there was nothing there. We get in the car and pull away. And that was it. That's the part that bothers me most, because none of us said a thing. As soon as we shut the doors, it was like it never happened. It wasn't until later that night, alone looking at some snapshots I took of the hike, I started to piece it together. On a whim, I message my friend Joe, who's into weird stuff, and I tell him a short version of the events. He never replied, and I forgot about it. Over a few years and several phones, I never deleted that message. It was like a blank spot set where my memory of it should be. I could only remember it clearly when I reread it. Another strange thing is that both my sister and I are into Bigfoot and 411, yet we never once discussed it. I brought it up once a couple of years ago. Something like, Hey, remember that weird trail we went on? Her only reply was, I'll never go on that trail again. And that was that. It never came up ever again. Hearing a monkey scream in that forest was the most scared I've ever been in my entire adult life. What sticks with me the most was, however, at the end. It was a hatred I can't describe just emanating like that stench accompanying it. Just absolute, total hatred. Directed at me, not my sister, 
not my niece. Whatever it was, it wanted me to know that it was me, that it despised me completely, that it would have been here at the finish line no matter what. So don't go stirring things up. You aren't and won't be in control. And scariest of all, whatever it is, it hates you. The Way It Laughed From Tess 200 I never thought something like this would happen to me. I've grown up in the woods my whole life and never once had a scary experience. I'm 22 and live in Ontario, Canada. My parents live out in the wilderness and have two properties, one with their house on it and the other down the road with 200 acres with a long trail that leads about 100 acres into a private lake. We regularly take ATVs out and ride them to the lake to fish, swim, and relax on the dock with a cold one. Recently, I lost my job due to the Rona, so I moved out of my apartment and drove up north to stay with my parents until it's over. Luckily, my other siblings haven't lost their jobs, so they still are in the city, but one of my brothers came up for a long weekend to fish with my dad. They went ahead on the two of our three ATVs to the lake. I decided to join and follow after them, but the third ATV was giving me trouble. I checked the gas and it was full. I tried to pull start it, but no luck. So I told my mom I'd take my car and park at the front of the 200 acres, then walk to the lake. It was a beautiful day, so I didn't mind a nice, long, sunny walk. Then I could go for a cool swim. So I hopped in my car and drove over. I parked and set off on the path, my phone playing music to scare away any animals on my way there. At least, that's what I thought it would do. It usually takes 50 minutes to walk into the lake. 35, maybe 40 if you run down the crude trail. I was at a fast-paced walk enjoying the views and music. About 20 minutes later, I heard voices to my left in the woods. I turned off my music to listen. Sometimes my family would go off the trail on ATVs, so I called out to see if it was my dad or brother wandering around. I got no reply, but I didn't hear any engine noises, so I kept on walking. A minute later, I saw something run across the path ahead of me. It ran on all fours. I stopped in my tracks. It was big. A wolf, a deer, maybe a bear? I couldn't be sure, but I started to back away slowly and stand tall like you should when confronted by an animal. I looked around the forest and noticed how silent it got. Not even wind rustled through the leaves in the trees. My hair was all standing on end on my arms, and goosebumps trailed up my arms and legs. I felt like I was in danger. My head on a swivel, I kept looking around me to try to identify where the threat was coming from, until I heard footsteps from right behind me. I jerked around, and twenty feet away stood this tall, thing. It had gray skin, and it was bony. It was as tall as a small house, about nine feet. It was standing upright, on two hooves, and it had antlers that were white and yellow. It appeared to be decaying, its head hung to one side, arms falling past its knees. It had hollow eye sockets, but it felt as if they were looking into my soul but my eyes went down and focused on its hands. It had bony human hands, and they looked like they were prepared to reach out to me. My voice caught in my throat. My flight or fight instinct pushed me into a full-out run right down the path in the direction of the lake. I heard it behind me, like it wasn't even trying to keep pace with me, waiting for me to tire out. I was so panicked, I didn't even realize I'd lost track of the trail. I was just on it, 
but now I was jumping through the brush of the forest until I got my foot stuck in between a fallen tree's branches. I looked back, and the thing was still coming. I didn't have time. I slipped my foot out of my shoe and kept going until I reached a clearing filled with tall grass. At this point, I was so tired. I was breathing hard. I ran, then crawled into a patch of thick grass and weeds, trying to steady my breathing as that thing entered the edge of the clearing seconds later. It stayed just on the edge looking around the clearing with its hollow gaze. When I heard what I thought was laughter, it was like a chuckle that sounded like a rattle. Then it spoke in a voice familiar to me, like my dad's. Where are you, small one? I need your help with something. I was trembling, trying to hold back my panic, tears falling down my face. Then, a sound off in the forest drew its attention. It ran out of the clearing so fast, I barely had time to register that the creature was gone. I lay there, quiet and still. I don't know how long until I heard the forest come alive with noise, like it just woke up all of a sudden around me. I stood cautiously, feeling a painful twinge in my ankle. I looked down to see an angry bruise starting to form from when I got caught in that tree. I wasn't sure where I came from, and I know they say to stay put if you're lost in the woods, but there was no way I was waiting for that thing to come back. I looked at some trees to get my bearing of which way was north. My parents taught me that moss mostly grows on the north side of the trees, so I had the general direction of north. When I looked up to the sky, the sun was getting low, so I couldn't see it through the trees. But the way the light was coming, I knew that was west. The lake was southeast. I was running in that direction, so I'd want to go northwest to get back to the road, to my car. So I walked or limped in that direction, still looking around, holding my breath every time the forest seemed too quiet, then letting it out when I heard a bird's call or a squirrel chitter. It took about an hour as I had to fix my direction every now and again, and the forest has bogs and thick brush, which is hard to navigate through with a hurt ankle and lack of a shoe. I told him I was chased by something through the forest, and I got turned around. He told me my brother was riding around the trail to look for me, and we had to wait for him, but I asked to wait in the car. I felt unsafe out in the open. I felt like we were being watched, constantly. He agreed and sat with me in the car until my brother showed up 20 minutes later, but in those 20 minutes, I told my dad the whole story. He was very quiet. He told me not to say anything to my brother when he showed up, so as to not spook him. My brother ran around the car and opened the door, giving me a big hug because he had been worried about me. They asked if I needed to go to the hospital, looking up my foot, but I didn't think it was that serious, so we went back to my parents' place. It was my left foot so I could drive back to the house without an issue, and they took the ATVs. I drove back shakily, just wanting to feel safe inside a building with my family present. When we arrived at the house after I parked, I got out of the car and saw that outside the house on the porch was my shoe, the one I'd lost in the forest. I saw it and started to break down into tears. My brother was so confused, but my dad hugged me and took me inside. I ended up telling my mom and brother what happened. My dad just didn't want to freak my brother out at the time because he was ATVing alone, looking for me. I iced my foot and thankfully didn't need a doctor. After we did some research, well, mostly my brother, we ended up calling a shaman to come bless my parents' properties a few days later. The shaman also gave me an amulet carved from wood and told me to wear it when I'm in the woods to protect me from evil spirits. He was very adamant about me wearing it. 
If what I saw was an evil spirit, I plan on never going back in the woods alone again. It's become a part of my day to put on the amulet before I go outside. So far, nothing else has happened, and I'm thankful to say I haven't seen that thing again. Since that encounter two months ago, I feel like I've lived through a horror movie, and I can say I hated every second of it. I still can't get that thing's rattling laugh out of my head. Army Scout, Hunted by Bigfoot From 19 Delta Scout Looking back at almost 30 years of service as a soldier in the U.S. Army, I can comfortably say that it was an honor and a privilege to serve such a great and remarkable country. During my time, I managed to acquire several combat military occupational specialties, or MOS, which include Vulcan Gunner, Stinger Gunner, Artillery Gunner, and Combat Infantrymen. My favorite MOS, however, definitely has to be the Cavalry Scout. As the name implies, an Army Cavalry Scout is the eyes and ears of the Maneuvering Combat Battalion. We usually operate alone and far ahead of the main combat force, oftentimes behind enemy lines. Using stealth and silence, we locate enemy positions, determine where they have laid their mines, locate their barriers and ambush positions, and find ways to outflank their defensive positions. To be a scout, you have to be able to act independently and confidently, because more often than not, army scouts will usually be outnumbered and surrounded. Conducting reconnaissance behind enemy lines is not a job for everyone, but if you're daring and crazy enough, it's a job that a select few would really enjoy. The one skill that an army scout needs above all else is the ability to read a map, determine your coordinates on the ground, and have the ability to navigate stealthily to your objective. A scout is virtually useless if he can't read a map and ends up getting lost. As such, a large part of a scout's training consists of land navigation in all terrains, weather conditions, and environments, including forests, dense woodland, deserts, and swamps. While I was training to be a scout, our class was dropped out somewhere in the middle of a dense forest, somewhere in Pennsylvania, at 11 o'clock at night. It was a cool November evening, and the only illumination came from the full moon, which shone brightly in the sky. There were 16 of us who had advanced to this phase of training, including one guy who was a former U.S. Navy SEAL. We were each given a map, a compass, a red lens flashlight, water, night vision goggles or NVGs, and four hours to find at least four out of five points located on the map. Each point we had to find was located somewhere inside the black forest that surrounded us. A point consisted of nothing more than a wooden pole sticking out of the ground, with an ammunition can at the base. Inside that ammunition can was a description of an enemy position. For example, a description might read, Enemy machine gun, position facing north. The scout would then have to write it down as best he could. Beside the darkness, there were several other factors working against us. For one, some of the points were located relatively close together, separated by about 20 meters or so. This meant that the scout had to track precisely to the correct point, or else risk navigating to the wrong one. Also, all 16 of us were given different points to navigate to, so there would be absolutely no helping each other. This was strictly an individual training event, and it was timed. Anyone who failed to successfully find the four out of five points in the designated time would have to come back tomorrow evening and try again. Finally, we were told that there were several enemy soldiers out there, somewhere in the forest, who would be hunting us. If one of them caught us, we would be brought back to the start point and have to do it all over again. The land navigation site was a densely forested area, roughly 10 square miles, and was crisscrossed with streams, which we'd have to navigate in the dark. A dirt road surrounded the entire area, and if a scout came to that dirt road, he knew he had reached the boundary. Also, if a scout became completely lost in the dark, he was to make his way to the dirt road and await pickup. Joking and insults would then follow. An instructor gave me a list of five points. I went to the front of an HMMWV, or Humvee, 
and use the hood as a makeshift table. Using my red lens flashlight, I plotted all five points on my map. This was perhaps the most important part of the process. If a scout plotted his points incorrectly on the map, he would never find his points, especially in a pitch black forest. After double and triple checking that I had correctly plotted my points, I studied the map to see what terrain I could expect. Two of my points were located on small hilltops. Two were located in a valley, which would require me to cross two streams, and one was located near the boundary next to the dirt road. That last point was farthest out, but also the easiest to find. All five of my points were located in an area roughly three miles square. My plan was to find that last point first, then work my way back to the start point. The only variable that I couldn't control were the enemy soldiers who would be hunting us. After assuring that my NVGs operated correctly, I secured it on my forehead. Satisfied that I had all my gear secured to make as little noise as possible, I stepped off of the dirt road and plunged down into the black forest. Immediately, unseen branches like skeletal fingers reached out from the darkness to scratch my face and hands. I was only 20 meters inside the woodline, but already the sounds and activities behind me had all but disappeared. I slowly knelt, closing my eyes and letting my ears see into the dark. To my left, about 10 meters away, one of my fellow scouts was also moving through the forest to find his points. Further ahead of me, I could hear movements somewhere in the woods, a skittering noise running through the undergrowth, perhaps a raccoon or some other rodent. The fallen leaves on the ground crunching underfoot would give away our movement. We'd have to be extra careful and stealthy to avoid attracting attention. I got up and continued walking towards my first point, counting my steps so that I could judge how far I'd traveled, and keeping my eyes on my compass to ensure that I was heading in the correct direction. I was suffering from tunnel vision, as I could only see what was directly in front of me. I had almost no peripheral vision because of my NVGs. The terrain was steadily sloping downwards as I descended into the valley. Occasionally, I would stop and kneel to scan my surroundings to see if I was being followed. So far, however, it was all quiet. It appeared that I was all alone on this stretch of forest. At the bottom of the valley, the ground became muddy, and at one point I sank to the top of my boots in cold mud. A stream about eight feet wide crossed in front of me. I debated on whether to cross the stream or find a way around it. Further upstream by a few hundred meters, I heard a loud splash followed by a soldier yelling, Son of a... I chuckled to myself and silently climbed down into the stream. Looking left and right to ensure that I wasn't spotted, I climbed over a few fallen tree branches and waded into the water. It was ice cold and came up to my knees, but at least the running water was washing the mud off of my boots. Upon reaching the other side, I climbed up the muddy shore on the opposite bank, I stopped briefly to make sure that I was undetected. I hauled myself up an embankment and, wet, cold, and muddy, I continued up the slope of the valley. Fortunately, since it was November, mosquitoes or any other buzzing insects were a minor annoyance. However, as I walked up that slope, I slowly began to realize I had not heard any buzzing insect noises at all. If you've done this job long enough, you begin to develop what I call a warning radar, a sense that there is something just not right with your surroundings. You learned to trust your warning radar, and I could swear that I was being watched. This annoyed me more than anything else, because I was the one who stalked. I didn't like being stalked. At the top of the slope, I got on the ground and scanned the area again. Yep, there he was. About 50 meters to my right front, crouching behind a stand of trees was an enemy soldier. He was looking away from me, probably trying to stalk the other soldier who yelled when he fell into the stream. At night, sound carries farther, so I very slowly crawled back down the slope and walked another 50 meters away from the enemy soldier, then climbed the slope again. 
Scanning the area around me again, I found the path ahead was clear. I pulled out a poncho from a small pack on my back and covered myself with it. I pulled out my map and flashlight. I determined how far off course I'd gone and adjusted my heading and pace count. Satisfied that I was still heading in the correct direction, I put the poncho away and slowly stood up to proceed. Suddenly, far off to my left, I heard the enemy soldier yell, You've been captured, Scout. Return to the start point and restart your mission. I chuckled again when I heard the voice of the scout who fell in the stream yell another, Son of a... I continued walking through the forest, and the trees eventually thinned out. I stopped again and took a knee behind a fallen tree, listening. My internal warning radar was giving me the all clear. I closed my eyes and let my ears see for me again. Ahead of me, I could hear the low rumbling of a Humvee. Just as I calculated, the dirt road marking the perimeter was about 200 meters ahead of me. I waited until the sound of the Humvee passed, then made my way to the road, stopping just inside the wood line. I looked to my right, and sure enough, only 20 feet away just off the road was my first point. I cautiously approached the wooden pole. I grabbed the ammunition can and took it back to the tree line. I cracked open the ammunition can, and the noise of the metal can opening seemed to scream in the dark. I cursed, but apparently nobody heard the noise. Covering myself again with the poncho, I took out my flashlight, and I copied down what was written on the enemy description inside the can. At vicinity grid PB... 3354459 as an enemy patrol near the road i put the ammunition can back at the point and walked back into the forest an hour and a half had passed and i had found my first point i had another two and a half hours to find at least three more but those would be quicker my next two points were south of me almost in a straight line on the slopes of a hill Although it would have been easier to walk along the crest of the hill to get to the next point, I didn't want to risk being silhouetted by the moon, so I stayed below the crest of the hill where the trees were thicker, but the movement was slower. I paralleled the top of the hill for about 300 meters until I came to the spot where my second point should be. Low crawling to the top of the hill, I scanned around with the NVGs. I was off by about 50 feet, but there was my second point sticking straight up in the middle of a clearing. I was about to get up and approach it when my warning radar went off in my head. I wasn't alone. I knelt back down and scanned the forest area surrounding the clearing again. There was the faint scent of feces like cow dung wafting across the clearing. There, 75 meters at my one o'clock, a figure that looked like it was wearing a sniper's ghillie suit, was peering out of the forest. It wasn't one of my fellow scouts. We hadn't been given the ghillie suit camouflage, so it must have been one of the enemy soldiers. And boy, did he stink. I hated to think what he had fallen into. Fortunately, he wasn't looking in my direction. I observed him for a few tense seconds. Then he stood up and turned to leave. Jeez, that guy was huge. I waited a few more seconds until I could not smell him anymore. Then I entered the clearing to retrieve the ammunition can. At vicinity grid PB3009668 is an enemy anti-tank emplacement at the top of the hill. I came off the top of the hill grateful to be back inside the thick tree line, but the leaves crunching under my boots sounded like the roar of jets in that dark and lonely forest. Every crunching step seemed to shout, there's a scout over here. Crunch, crunch, crunch. I stopped suddenly and slowly got down on my belly. Crunch, crunch, crunch. These footsteps were behind me, approaching my position. I cursed. Stinky enemy soldier in the ghillie suit was stalking me. He must have been beyond 75 meters from me because I didn't smell him at the time. If I had the time, I would have ate around him. But another 30 minutes had passed, and I needed to get my third point. I needed to get to where the trees weren't so thick, so I made my way back up the slope, and was able to fast walk and jog across the crest of the hill for about a quarter mile. 
The bad part was because I'd chosen to go back up the slope, the full moon illuminated me the whole time. Also, my pace count was off, although I knew that I was still headed in generally the right direction to my third point. I ran down the slope and back into the wood line again, stopping to see if stinky enemy soldier in the ghillie suit had followed me. Satisfied that I had lost him, I began searching the area for my third point. Because I'd made a detour up the slope and had lost my pace count, I was not as accurate in positioning myself close to the third point. I just knew it was around here somewhere here in a 50 meter radius. The bad thing about NVGs is that while it gives the wearer an amazing ability to see in the dark, it also severely limits the wearer's depth perception. I found the point literally by accident, when I inadvertently kicked over the ammunition can. The loud clang echoed in the night, and I shook my head, cursing my bad or good luck. I pulled out my flashlight again. I copied down the enemy description that was inside the can. At vicinity grid PB288-34755 is an enemy command post. I returned the can back to the point, and I was turning to go to my fourth point, when I could make out the faint smell of cow dung again. Man, stinky enemy soldier in the ghillie suit sure was fast for a big guy, as well as persistent. It was almost two in the morning, which meant that I had a little over an hour to find my fourth point. If I had any time left, I'd look for the fifth point, which was only a quarter mile from the start. I turned due south and headed back down into the valley. The whole time, my warning radar was going off in my head, Sometimes I thought I could smell that cow dung, and I secretly wished that stinky guy following me would fall into the stream. The trees were thicker towards the base of the valley where the stream ran, so it was much darker with very little moonlight shining through, but it was still pleasantly cool, though I was hot and sweaty by this time. I calculated that I was at a bend in the stream, about 500 meters away from where I first crossed it. This fourth point was weird because it looked to be directly in the stream on my map, meaning it could be on either bank of the stream. I wasn't looking forward to crossing both sides of it, but I didn't have much of a choice. I knew that my fourth point was here somewhere close by. I silently searched my side of the muddy stream for about 50 meters. The rippling of the waters masked any noise I made, but it also masked the noise of any approaching bad guys as well. Finding nothing on my side of the stream, I once again climbed down an embankment and waded across the icy cold water to the other side. There I began my search again. I looked for another 50 meters and still saw nothing except mud and fallen trees. I was beginning to doubt that I plotted this point correctly when I looked at the stream again and noticed something that I hadn't seen before. In the middle of the stream was a narrow dry spot of land like a miniature four-foot square island. In the middle of this island was my fourth point. I waded back into the water, and after I covered myself with my poncho, I quietly opened the ammunition can. At vicinity grid PA009-58824 is an enemy submarine base. Really, I thought, a submarine base? Ah, whatever. I closed the ammunition can and set it back down when the smell of cow dung seemed to hit me like the heat you feel when you open a hot stove. I cursed. Even though I'd found the necessary points that I needed, I still had to get back to the start point without being caught, or else I'd have to do this all over again. How did Stinky Guy keep finding me? Very slowly, I knelt down on the island and crawled backwards into the freezing water. The smell was all around me, and there was a noise like branches breaking on the bank, followed by splashing sounds only 50 meters to my left. The moon shone down at the place where there was a bend in the stream. Outlined in the light was big, big, stinky enemy soldier guy. Most of my body was submerged in the water, with my upper body hugging that little strip of island in the middle of the stream. I looked up at the guy who was 50 meters away from me, had gulped. What I had at first thought was a ghillie suit seemed to actually be fur. It was a good seven and a half to eight feet tall and had a gorilla-like face and was covered with dark, thick fur. 
This creature stood in the middle of the stream, looking around and seeming to sniff at the air. Great, I thought. I'm being stalked by a freaking Sasquatch, but since I know where you are and you don't know where I am, I guess I'm stalking you now. I began to wonder if I'd packed any more beef sticks in my pack since I saw a commercial once on television where the Sasquatch things seemed like beef sticks. All of a sudden in the distance came the blaring of multiple horns, which seemed to echo all around the valley. I cursed again. That was the warning signal that all scouts had 30 minutes to finish finding their points and return to the start line. By this point, I was more annoyed than frightened. I was wet, cold, irritated, and muddy. Fortunately, I'd wrapped my waterproof notebook with all of my plot points inside of my waterproof poncho, and I kept it on the small island, out of the water. Still, I had only 30 minutes to make it back to the start line, but tall, dark, and stinky was standing in the middle of the stream, looking around like a lost grandpa at the mall. That big, hairy McDingleberry was going to cost me getting my recon scout qualification. It seemed like I lay there for hours, but in reality, it was only a few seconds. After the horns began to blare, Big Stinky seemed to let out a huff and ran back up the embankment from which he had emerged. I waited for the smell to dissipate before hauling myself out of the stream and double-timing it back to the start point. Although I was the last scout to return to the star point, I was feeling pretty good when our trucks brought us back to the barracks. Two scouts got lost and had to be picked up by the side of the road, and two other scouts failed to find four of their five points. These guys would have to try again tomorrow night. Only one guy, the former Navy SIL, found all five of his points. And although I found only just enough points to pass the course, I also stalked a Bigfoot. How many other cavalry scouts can say that? The Shift From Xavier I am 18 years old and I've been in Pennsylvania throughout my life. This was an encounter that changed me forever. On New Year's Eve of 2018, my family and I were on our way to meet up with my third cousin, Lance, We'd be going to his outdoor home to celebrate the new year. I usually never really cared about him. Honestly, my father and him used to mess around for a bit when they were kids. But now they work together. So much so that we're going to start working on gardening and farming. Which I never really got into. And I absolutely hated it. Even to this day, they still do it, and I hate it. What's always teed me off is the fact that my father is a bit of a control freak. He likes to clean other people's stuff, but not in our own house. I have nothing wrong against Lance. He was a conductor in the music arts. He works at a funeral home, and he seems to be a good husband. Anyway, he had bought the outdoor home about three months before the celebration of the new year. The home looked a bit unusual. Not the stereotypical haunted cabin in the woods, but it was strange. It had a plastic roofing on the balcony. The pillars weren't straight. It had a basketball hoop in the parking lot that nobody used. In fact, now that I come to think of it, I don't think the original owners or builders ever used it either. However, the interior was astoundingly beautiful. Tan painted walls, 4K flat screen TV against the wall, the lovely pictures of the Amazon rainforest, a marble kitchen counter, all the works. I'll give him this. He did a wonderful job cleaning up the place for three months. There are three other people in the home, Uncle John, who's the owner of the funeral home, Francis, who is a lovely husband to Lance, and Nancy. She's 80 years old, and to this day, I really don't know who she is. As we got there, food was already prepped and ready to eat. As day turned to night, all of us notice at the home it's a bit chilly. Lance asked me to check downstairs at the basement to make sure that the furnace was still running, and so I did. I went and investigated... As soon as I opened the hatch, I saw that the last log had been burnt. I checked behind me to see if there were some logs piled up, but there wasn't. I went back upstairs and asked Lance where the log pile was. When he answered, I was immediately annoyed. The log pile in question had been set up about a quarter of a mile away from the home. It was 11.45. 
There was no way in heck I could somehow rush a quarter of a mile, lift the heavy logs, and make it back just in time to hit 12. My father volunteered to go, because, you know, he wants to make himself useful. I told him that I can actually take care of things on my own, but I really wish I didn't say that. Not because I was going to be late, but because I was about to witness something terrible. I went along and put my leather coat, gloves, and cap on. I grabbed the wagon for the pile, and I head out in the dark, cold night. There was a full moon shining on the snow, but it wasn't that bright, so I'd have to use my phone as a flashlight. As I walked further and further away from the house, I thought to myself, Ah, oh, great. I bet I'm going to die from some sort of spooky ghost or something of the sort. But no sooner that that had popped into my head, I heard something to my right. I shined my flashlight in the direction of where it came from, but there was nothing there. I panicked and thought, I'm going to be that kid that disappeared in Stranger Things. I took a moment to calm down. I reminded myself it could just be a deer, a rabbit, a squirrel. Worst case scenario, a coyote or a bear. I kept myself calm, and I kept walking. As I kept going, I kept hearing the noise, as if it was following me. I was curious though, so I stopped, and the noise stopped. When I kept going, the noise came back. I still kept my cool. Finally, I made it to the log pile. Next to the pile was a lantern on top of a stump. I put away my phone and lit it up. I moved the logs into the wagon one by one. As I finished putting the last log on top, I heard a growl. A deep growl. And that's when it hit me. I'm in the middle of the woods. It's a full moon, and there's some sort of thing behind me. There just had to be. There's no way it could be anything else. I wasn't making this up. I grabbed my phone and turned on the flashlight. I turned around, and there it was. Some sort of creature 12 feet away from me. A creature with a human body, covered in fur, extremely muscular. It had a tail and stood about 7 feet tall, and its head was wolf-shaped. Now most people use the fight-or-flight response. A lot of folks run away when they see something like this. Even some try to fight. I wasn't those people. In fact, I was geeking out a bit. I was really into mythology and folklore. I was a skeptic of the supernatural, but I studied it and adored it. When I first laid eyes on this beautiful creature, it was incredible to witness. But then I thought for a moment. This thing had been stalking me. Finally, I got the normal human response. My heart sank. My brain was confused being excited and afraid. But something crazy happened. This werewolf-looking thing just lost interest in me and walked away. I wasn't going to let this opportunity be taken away from me. I went to camera mode on my phone, and I tried to take a picture. But when I looked at it, a bug was on the lens, attracted to the light that was still on. I wouldn't realize this until later. Two years later, that memory still keeps me on my toes. I didn't bother telling my friends or family about what I saw, except for my girlfriend. She was always a believer of anything of that sort. In fact, she's a pagan witch. I needed some way to get this experience out of my head. I tried drawing it up, but it didn't help. I eventually turned to screenwriting. Because of the whole Rona thing in 2020, I figured it was a good opportunity to expand my creativity and at least try to get this out of my head and onto paper. I began to write the pilot draft to a series called Shift. The story goes, Josh McAllister accidentally gets cut by the remains of a werewolf and has to fight off other creatures and an ancient evil covenant. Nevertheless, that experience was no longer lingering in me. Working on this, it got me thinking it could be a huge step up in my life. All because of that incident. All because that creepy werewolf had been stalking me. And I gotta thank him for that. <laughs>